be respectful of Mr. Reeves time. I'm going to start with um, the routine announcements, um, by which means I got to reshare my screen. Everybody knows and we are being recorded, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Um, uh, it, it's important because well I'll make that clear in half a second, but it is true. So I'm going to share my slides for the purpose of doing some administrative business. Um, the first thing is to the end of the semester. So this is a repetition of information you already have, but I'm going to go over it again. There's no more reading. We're done with uh, assigned reading for the semester. Sunday night movies continue. We'll be, I'll give you more on that in a minute or so. Sunday's writing prompt will be based on material presented by Mr. Reeves today. So I'll come up with something in the hour that follows today's discussion and I'll post it and email it to everybody. Everybody knows gaming presentations start on Monday. Um, I wanna remind you about what I'm supposed to get at the conclusion of the gaming presentations. Um, a two to three page written statement of your research and thinking. Um, and that doesn't have to be, it's not a paper. I'm not looking for a paper. I am looking for something a little bit more than notes. And by that, I mean like, I don't know, mostly complete sentences, just so that I can, if I read your, the, this two to three page thing you're gonna give me, I can remember what you said. <laughs> um, that's the purpose behind asking for that. So it, it can be kind of like your notes and I, I don't want you to turn it into something bigger than it has to be. Um, you're gonna give me copies of all the links and to anything you hand out or show to us so that I can, again, retain a copy. Um, and you need to evaluate one another. And I believe that I emailed that out to everyone. The Excel spreadsheet for doing that is on the uh, gaming presentations tab. You fill out one for each member of the group, label it properly and mail it back to me so I can put it in everybody's file and calculate grades in that way. Is there, are there any questions about those matters right now? Before I go to- Professor, I wanna ask you one thing, just real quick. These notes, we have to send each of us separately to you or like in a group? It doesn't matter how I get them. I'm, I'm content any way I can have them. Um, if you okay. wanna send them direct, that's fine. And really it is pr pr your presentation notes just in a fashion that I can read. Make okay. sense? Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I'll add, I thought I heard another voice. I don't know who was speaking. Rach, go ahead. Sorry, I got, I got here a little bit late. Um, so you said that you want us to give you copies or links to all the readings and all the sources we use. Um, I don't know if you just answered to this, but like, can I put my sources with my notes with like the two, three pages that you want us to write? Okay. Yep. Did, you want to, did you prefer the group to do all the sources? Uh, no, no, it just that, that was a, that's a close question to what uh, Natik was asking. I'm glad to have it however I can get it. Okay. So that if you want to just include it directly in an email to me, that's completely fine. Okay. Um, anything else on that point? Next slide. Just want to remind you that since this the point of this was to go over everything up to the end of the semester, the final exam comes due to me on. May 24 at six o'clock. No surprise, no change. Late journals. This is the change. This is the new information. This is why you're glad you're here. I'll take them, right? Um, and yes, they count for 20 points each and they count for the, toward the 300 points necessary to be exempt from the final exam. Do them. <laughs> Do them. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Can I, if, if you were my children, I, I, I tease my children with some regularity, I would say you're all a bunch of gobbling turkeys. <laughs> um, just do them. Any other questions on that point? Valerie, please. Um, how will we know if we reach the 300? There's actually a grades tab within uh, Blackboard. You should be able to see your grades at all times. The tally. It, is it like the total one or is it just all of like the journals that we have? To uh, that's a, that's an interesting question that I've never considered. Um, I think that's a total. When, yeah, when you, I'm pretty sure when you graded um, the interview assignments, they, it added to the total. So you can so, just subtract whatever that amount is. Yeah. Friends got it. Thank you. Anything else on that point?
Don't we have to wait for you to um to grade all of them before we can see if we got the full three hundred? Like how I'm just I'm trying to think about like that's a fair question. Want, you know what I mean? Like as far as like you'll you should I I'm sorry, guys. I think I think we're on the same track here. You'll know by the end of classes on Monday the seventeenth. Of, of May, whether or not you've reached that number. Okay, got it, thank you. I'll get myself caught up. I know I owe a couple, about five interview-based papers and you, I owe grades on those. I, I'm, I'm getting there slowly, right, Peter? Um, Sunday night, movie night. We didn't get to talk about James Brown. I assigned some James Brown, some, some reading on James Brown. We didn't get to talk about it, so we're gonna watch a movie about James Brown. Uh, Mr. Dynamite, Rise of James Brown. Uh, the guys who were in my oral history class last fall met the producer of this film, uh, Blair Foster. I've asked Blair to come back. Uh, we only watched a, a few minutes of this film in the fall, and we're going to show the whole thing. Um, it's a really great movie. I, I know, how can you not love James Brown? So we'll watch some James Brown, right? I've seen it 12 times. <laughs> because it's awesome. And, and, and Blair is a, is a I'll call her a colleague, a friend. Uh, she's certainly a friend of the, of the departments. Um, so come, Marcus, come watch it with us. Right. I'm making that up. You've seen it 12 times. <laughs> um, but drop in at 930 and you can talk to Blair about it, maybe. Maybe she'll come. Um, so that's my administrative stuff. Are there other matters that I need to cover with you guys before I introduce Mr. Reeves? Um, is this Sunday going to be the last um, extra credit or is there going to be another one? Okay. We go all the way through the 16th of May. Okay. The last you. day of classes is May 17. I've seen some misinformation out there that the last day of classes is earlier than that. The last day of classes is the 17th. We'll go all the way through the 16th. Uh, Sydney, um, please. Professor, um, yeah. for the final exam, I know it's due on the 24th, but when um, do you plan on making it available? The 17th. Okay. Um, and the information for the final exam, it's on Blackboard? It will be both on Blackboard and it will be emailed to you. Okay, thank you. And posted in Slack. I'll put it everywhere. Okay. I I'm hopeful that covers most of it. If it doesn't, email me or stick around after class. I want to introduce our guest, um, a person I like very much, Mr. Marcus Reeves. Um, here's my introduction of Mr. Reeves. Um, today, I'm very pleased to introduce um, uh, Mr. Mark Marcus Reeves, author of Somebody Scream. Mr. Reeves is currently an adjunct uh, professor at NYU teaching a course in the history of hip hop. He's worked as a content producer at VH1 and BET, produced a show called Somebody Scream at WBAI from two 2008 to 2011, has worked as a freelance writer for the New York Times, The Village Voice, and was a music editor at the source um, in the late 1990s, if I remember that right. Uh -huh. um, I've asked Mr. Reeves to come and talk to us about the history of hip hop and the way hip hop artists have responded to the events of the last four years in particular. Before I, I turn the floor over to Mr. Reeves, I wanna make this very clear. The class is being recorded um, and will be made publicly available on YouTube. Um, I hope the recording is happening. Uh, I need to make sure that recording is happening. I have to stop my share to make sure that's happening. Now I'm recording. That's all. Okay, I think it's recording. So I'm gonna reshare re so I can go back to my screen. Um, <coughs> I've been asked to do a land acknowledgement. Um, our Dean does these with some regularity. Brooklyn College is located on land that is the traditional and unseated territory of the Canarsie and Nyack Lenape people, land enriched by the blood of enslaved Africans. We as the Brooklyn College community acknowledge that academic institutions, indeed the nation state itself, was founded upon and continues to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous and black peoples. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle ongoing practices and legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist and live on these lands. We pay our respects to indigenous and other elders past, present, and future. And with that, I ask uh, you to turn your attention to 
Mr. Reeves, I'm going to stop the share. And uh, uh, Marcus, you have authority as co-host if you'd like to share your screen for any reason. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not going to have any, I'm just going to be talking. Um, with that land acknowledgement, I love that intro. And uh, I know, you know, <laughs> this is a very progressive um, intro. Um, first of all, thank you for having me again to come talk to the class. Um, before I get into my discussion, I just wanted to let you know, while I do know a lot of, you know, I know a lot about hip hop, today's landscape, there are so many artists that I won't know by name. So I'm going to talk about the hip hop in terms of movements and concepts. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to ask the class because I see you have a pretty diverse uh, group of students here. First of all, what are some of the artists that you guys, some of the hip hop artists you like and why do you like them? Like, what about them that you like? What about their music you like? Anybody want to take the floor? I'm going to pick on Louie. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Louie. Um, to answer the question, I, I listened to a lot of, I guess, 90s uh, hip hop. My dad was all about Eric B, Rakim. I'm, I just grew up listening to Nas, Jay, uh, Pun. Um, I, I, I can go on and on, but I, the more new school artist I like is uh, Joey Badass. I think his 1999 album was reminiscent of a lot of things. I'm not going to go as far as to say it's reminiscent of Illmatic, uh, which I think is the greatest album to ever, hip hop album to ever uh, uh, be be created. Uh, but yeah, that's that that would be my answer, Mr. Mr. Marcus. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, any other people you like that like any other new artists? You like you like pretty much artists if they're new. They they kind of continue. They're a continuum of what happened in the eighties and the nineties. Correct. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, if if I have to pick anybody to continue to, I guess pass on the torch or or got the torch passed to them, I would say maybe J Cole. Um. I don't think Kendrick has ever missed uh, when it comes to philosophy in his music. Um, I, Drake is definitely new school, so I wouldn't put him in that category. But as far as like um, lyricism, uh, I would say those two are probably the, the biggest two uh, rappers that I can think of. Myself included, I have an album out, but oh, okay. I, can't, I can't promote, so. No, but congratulations. Thank you so much. I saw uh, Sal's hand come up first and then Tamir. Okay, good. All right, so um, back in like middle school, all I listened to was 90s hip hop and like I was close to a lot of different things, but I don't really listen to much of it anymore. But um, so to this day, I think Big L is my favorite rapper, you know, um, him and um, you know, I'd say Lloyd Banks are up there just because like the way they deliver stories, they could, you know, uh, give punchlines. Like, you know, I like to hear something that really makes me either think or like, you know, at the end of a bar, I'm just like, oh, that's like hard, like, you know, stuff like that. And, um, but now um, on top of just lyricism, I also like, like um, music that has like some melody to it and whatnot. Like um, after like my nineties period, I got into Max B and whatnot. And uh Lately, I've been listening to a lot of like DJ Screw and like just anything that's melodic and like, you know, isn't too like hard or like too like um, full of nonsense, like SoundCloud music, I guess. You like SoundCloud, the SoundCloud. Somewhat, yeah, it's somewhat like, and there's stuff that's good, but for the most part, like, you know, I always shy away from it. There's a lot of stuff that gets put onto SoundCloud that isn't like, you know, SoundCloud rapper music, but you know. What do you, oh, just real quick before we move on. Yeah, no, what do you on. like about the SoundCloud and the rap? Uh, well, SoundCloud allows anybody to make music. I feel like Apple Music, you have to uh, be able to, uh, I don't know how you go about putting music onto Apple Music, but like there's a process to it. Anybody could go to uh, SoundCloud and put music up there and that allows me to listen to all types of things. I don't know who's creating music, but I'm listening to it. So, yeah. All right. Tamir. Let me, me, me get one more person and we get into to the discussion. All right, Tamir then. Um, yeah, so I guess like my earliest like introduction to hip hop would be like my uncle's only like eight years older than me, so like I would spend a lot of time with him, and he was like the biggest like Lil Wayne fan, and mm -hmm. that's how I like got introdu uh, introduced to music. Where that's for for at least like the earliest five years, like I will say my music childhood, like, Lil Wayne is all I listened to, and then it went into 
more like uh i strictly listen to even though i feel like it may be a bad thing but like i strictly listen to like more melodic rappers so like people like young thug okay. Lil Uber, playboy cardi uh Lil, um yeah like rappers you know like rappers like that and i don't know i guess it's more because i listen i listen to the music for sound instead of i would say like maybe louis more listen to music more for like the lyrics or to like um yeah, see, like, yeah, I knew people were going to say the mumble rap thing, but yeah, I, I wouldn't consider it mumble rap, but yeah, just like music. Don't like feel, that. don't feel self-conscious. If you, I wanted to hear, if you like the melodic stuff, I want to hear it, that you like it and why you like it. Because I'm from, a, I'm from the original school generation, so I just want to hear what the new, uh, what the new audience likes about this kind of music. Like, what do you get from it? I hear a lot of, a lot about vibe, about flow, about swag. And nothing less about you know his lyrical uh, skills, his style, things of that nature. I just wanted to get in tune with what was you know what were you connecting with the music right now. So that that would you would say it would be more of the vibe. Yeah, it would be like more like it, it just like like okay. So like I feel like um more like the rap where like there's more lyrical rap. I don't can't really for me I can't really connect with that. A lot of the stories that are told, I feel like. I can't really connect with where more so, like even though obviously like they're the more melodic rappers like Party and like who was either rapping about drugs and stuff like that where I don't connect with either. At least the sound of it makes up for it. You know what I mean? Okay. That's what I that's what I like connect with the most. Okay, all right. Well, again, that's what I hear a lot of uh, younger folks when they talk about hip hop. They talk about those exact things, and I I love engaging them and feel and feeling out why they like and what do they connect with within it, but. I'm going to get into my talk about, uh, well, pretty much today's hip hop. Um, from what I've been seeing over the last 10 years, hip hop has been in a, a new kind of phase, I like to call it. Uh, it's called, I call it hip hop Americana. And it's not, it's basically this new phase where hip hop is, it's already emerged. It's already knocked at the door of the mainstream. It's already walked into the mainstream and created a new world. Now it's pretty much an established uh, part of the center of American mainstream culture. Um, and there's several examples you see. You see Jay-Z with uh, Obama. <laughs> you see Obama when he was running for president, brushing his shoulders, using hip hop terms and, 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 and uh, gestures. Um, you see uh, Beyonce singing at the uh, inauguration. Uh, during this pandemic, how else has hip, hip hop changed the uh, American popular culture? We see uh, Club Quarantine with DJ uh, D-Nice. Um, we also see um, the rise of the platform Versus, which is, a, which is a very hot show. And it's basically connected with an audience across um, race, class, gender. Um, also, did anybody watch the uh, the, the Oscars, right? Who was the Who was the DJ? Who was the uh, musical director of the Oscars? Quest Love, uh, Kendrick Lamar got the Pulitzer. He's going to see break dancing at the Olympics. Um, oh, what about the Supreme Court? She just passed away. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What did they refer to her as? Notorious RBG. Exactly. And it was like everyone caught on to the I no one had to ask what were they referring to. Everybody knew what you're talking about. And to be able to put a Supreme Court justice in the context of a hip hop icon is, you know, you guys kind of grew up, you grew up in a hip hop world. But for someone who's watched this music rise to see someone in the Supreme Court referred to a rapper and everyone gets it, it's like a pinch yourself moment. <laughs> Um, and also there's other examples like uh, of, of hip hop getting into the set, basically becoming a part of hip hop Americana. You got LL Cool J being honored at the Kennedy, Kennedy Center. Um, anyone else have any reflections of how you see hip hop kind of uh, seen in everyday American life? Anyone else? I'm in Target right now, so please excuse the, um, the background noise. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, um, but 
came to mind was just like how I'm seeing a lot of young kids. I work in a high school, or actually it's a K through 12 school. So I'm seeing a lot of kids working, you know, a lot of hip hop terminology into, or maybe it's just American, African-American vernacular. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, just trying to, because, because now rap has become so mainstream, I'm noticing also that, you know, things that artists will say in rap songs, now kids are saying in the classroom and that's kind of bizarre to me (laughs) because it always felt you know I was born in 96 I'm not I'm not that old but I'm also not that young either so I'm kind of like in a I I don't I don't really um it's new ish to me to see rap be mainstream you know what I mean because I grew up you know of course with the G units and you know the zip sets and all that and it was very like underground kind of feel so now that it's more mainstream that's um, one of the biggest the biggest things that I've noticed okay and what was I say? Oh, and I forgot another example of how it's a part of America. And I think you just, uh, the, the person who just spoke last, I forget your name. Uh, it's the number one selling genre in America. It's the most popular genre in American popular culture, which um, is, a, was, is a big surprise to me. Another picture yourself moment, um, because this all kind of, you sort of, you kind of saw this uh, foreshadowed in 1998 or 99, when at, for the first time on Billboard's top 200, three albums, three rap albums sat at number three, number two, and number one. I think it was Jay Z, Outkast, and I forget the third person. Stillmatic. Yes. Was it Stillmatic? Yep. Okay. Those three albums. <laughs> thank you for helping. Those three albums sat at the top of the charts in February of either 99 or 98. Like I said, I don't really remember. Um, And the the fact that all of this stuff is happening with hip hop, again, some of you guys, I know you, it it might be a shock to you, but some of you, it might not be a surprise because you, you, you all were raised in the pretty much the nineties when the establishment of hip hop, the hip hop industry or what I would call hip hop America, not Americana yet was established. So you had, you grew up with hip hop radio, fashion, um, hip hop culture influence, starting to influence the world. And also, uh, when I wrote Somebody Scream, which is a history of, of, of hip hop, of rap music, I only went up, into a, up to a point around two th- to the mid 2000s. I mean, I wrote about, I wrote about the music, um, from the standpoint that it came out of the civil, the demise of the civil rights and the black power movements and it created kind of hip hop became, a, it filled a vacuum for a voice for uh, urban youth and uh, filled, the, filled the void for urban youth. And I kind of covered up to about 2005. Forgive me for a minute if I, so. to the, okay. But by the end of my book, it was, when I cover the book, when I cover up until the 2005, forgive me, I'm a little nervous, right? You, so, everybody is, everybody is with you. Okay. Everybody is with you. So <laughs> you got nothing to be nervous about. All right. Um, yeah, so basically my book, when I pretty much finished the book, it was in 2005. And, Pretty much hip hop was at a precarious time um, in its history. Um, hip, uh, hip hop artists were trying to, um, well, hip hop figures were trying to politicize the music and get people to be engaged politically because at the time you had George W. Bush, George W. Bush is the president. Um, and everybody, <laughs> excuse me. Basically, well, let me just run down. Basically, they were trying to politicize the music, but hip hop was weren't. They weren't. Uh... I I actually remember a lot about that as well. I don't know if you're trying to you're you're alluding to the fact that uh, Little Wayne. I think Kanye came out and said uh, something against uh, George W. Bush. That exactly. Doesn't like black people. So exactly. you had to, you sort of had this tug of war back then between hip hop trying to be politicized, but the content not exactly getting political. It was still pretty much on a gangster situation. And it was at a crossroads. The sales of hip hop were going down because of the internet. 
uh, but also young people were getting tired of the content. Um, you also had, um, what else was there? Uh, it, was just at, it was just basically at a crossroads. Um, oh, also there were outcries over, the hit, over hip hop and his language, over the N word, the D word. Um, and then pretty much at that time, hip hop was on its, I felt like hip hop was sort of in a change. I don't know if it was on its way out or if it was about to die in popularity. There was nothing to fill that void. But then something happened in the mid 2000s to the late 2000s. Uh, anybody could tell me what that was? It was something that helped change America. The way we communicate. <laughs> Basically it was the internet. The internet came and changed hip hop. Um, can anybody tell me how hip hop, how the internet changed hip hop in, in certain ways? Um, I could like think of an example, like um, the example of like Soldier Boy, how he made his rise to hip hop, like the age of the internet where people were having the ability to like um, illegally download people's songs. He had, the, he had the wherewithal to be like, you know what? I know that people do that, but I also want people to listen to my songs. So why not use the internet to my advantage? And he did that thing where like, I think like um, when Kanye and 50 Cent were having that beef, he put right. like um, a lime wire, he would put his music under their name, song titles. And that's like just his uh, internet to his advantage. Got a couple of hands. Sal, go ahead. A lot of the songs and hip hop in general to spread a lot quicker and more efficiently like if somebody uh knew about a song they tell to their friend they'll look it up and therefore it just go by word of mouth yeah exactly and going back to the soldier boy um the, the rise of soldier boy he was also able to ride along with the new movement of the ringtone rapper so basically as a as the record industry began to fall in the mid 2000s rappers began to try to find their way and figure out how they could uh, sell music in this new age where everyone's talking on their phone. So one of the ways was uh, ringtone rap. Anybody remember ringtone rap? I was, I was just about to say that. Yeah, it was really big when it came to ringtones. Uh, hey, Valerie, go ahead. Um, I also think on a general scale, it uh, the internet has really glamorized hip hop, whereas hip hop had this like for lack of better words, like a roughness that was very much like um, encompassing of like the hardships that people went through. And then post-internet, hip hop became very like, I want to say like superficial in nature, even though like there's definitely better words that I could use. But as Professor Napoli knows, I use that in like all of my essays because that's my favorite phrase to possibly use. But yeah. Okay. Um, how would you say? Also, when hip hop began to transition over into the web, it well, basically hip hop. I mean, um, the internet. While it was changing American life, it had changed in it, uh, hip hop. Hip hop, I felt, was also the best. It was out of all the genres during this uh, out all of the all the genres. I think hip hop was the best to utilize the internet. One of the reasons is because the internet, I mean, sorry, hip hop, hip hop, uh, basically, oof, <laughs> sorry. Hip hop is a, it came from, it was birthed from technology. It used, it utilized technology, it used turtle tables, tape decks, uh, hi-fi systems. And so, you know what, I just want to, Can I add something? Go ahead. I just, just want to say that maybe also the reason why internet changed everything is because, I mean, it's more independent. There's no censorship as it was on TV and radio. So even the language changed. I mean, that's like the TV shows going to the digital platforms. They changed really like, like 180% like degrees. So I think in the hip hop also, I mean, I, I came from the, Soviet descent. I mean, I only knew Tupac, Notarius, Snoop Dogg, and that's it. I didn't know anyone else. And then after internet, after it went away from the TV and radio and become an internet, I, I learned about other people too. Okay. Also, hip -hop, the internet changed the rules of hip hop. 
um, how an artist was supposed to come out. Um, anybody know how hip hop artists came out pre internet? Didn't you have to get a contract? I mean, uh, no, you no, I'm talking about before the record deal, before the before you had before you became before the internet, a hip hop artist had to make their bones through live shows, through uh, battles, through uh, working their way through a team of people uh, appearing on people's records. And there was a whole system set up of gatekeepers to kind of work on quality control. A lot of you talked about liking artists with uh, great lyrics and great style. Well, with the internet, you were able to kind of skip over all of that and put your music out to the people immediately and connect with whoever was listening. So the whole idea of uh, having lyrical skills or being a, a virtuoso rapper no longer mattered. Um, any, basically, if you see like a, like a Little Yachty, does anyone like Little Yachty? I um, do. Good. I do. Okay. And the, who's, who am I speaking to? Is this Louis? Oh, no, that's Tamir. 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 The fact... The fact that uh, Little Yachty, he's not, to me, he doesn't have the great lyrical skills of a virtuoso MC, but he's able to use the internet to bypass any gatekeepers and get an audience. That's how the internet changed hip hop in vastly different ways. Um, let's see. Who are some of the, and who are some of the, uh, the rap artists who, um, uh, who were some of the rap artists who, who were able to utilize the internet early on? Yes, yeah, so I guess I was like I just like I said, Soldier Boy was definitely one of them. Okay. And Jay what about go ahead? Jay Z. Jay Z. Mm -hmm. No, nah, Jay Jay Z came out pre-internet, but we have yeah. but the, you, one of the ones you would see is Little Wayne, Kanye, Fifty Cent. Um, Nicki Minaj, and out of that you see the growth of what comes as um, the SoundCloud movement. Rach, you had your hand up. I wonder what you had to contribute. Um, no, I was gonna say Little Wayne when he was asking the the rappers. And who else? You said Little who? I was gonna say Little Wayne. Okay. Anybody ever listen to Little B as well? Oh yeah, that's like definitely. That, that he gave birth to all the rappers that we know today. Like without Lil B, there is no people like Lil Yachty and all these other rappers, these SoundCloud rappers that we know of. And, <laughs> yeah, and that's Bass God. Okay, and, ba and uh, Professor uh, Foley, they're talking about Lil B, and you're talking about you talked about punk earlier. Uh, Lil B is to hip hop what Joey Ramone was to mm -hmm. rock and roll. Pretty much, just simple. He basically is lo-fi simple rhymes, the father of mumble rap. Um, let's see. What the internet, is, uh, also, how does the, how, also, how does the internet become a, um, what do you, the internet is a big part of how hip hop became pretty much mainstream. Does anybody have any idea of how um, hip hop became main, not mainstream, but how did it uh, establish hip hop um, as such a big genre today? It gives it a broader audience. Is there a broader audience? Anybody else? Yeah, like anybody could put up their music online and, uh get like listens and stuff. You don't have to like be on a label or like sign or anything like that. Exactly. Oh, anyone, anyone else? Fanny uh, put something in the chat. You know, she's, uh, she's uh, in a place where she can't talk so easy. So I'm going to repeat it. She says white people capitalized. White people capitalized. And one of the, one of the uh, important points about that is when the internet moved into, I'm sorry, when the hip hop moved into the internet and you had SoundCloud movement, one of the main audiences and one of the main, uh, some of the key artists were white. So it's one of the ways that the music kind of 
when I in, in somebody scream, I talk about how hip hop became the voice, not just of young black people, but of American youth. This was one of the manifestations of that is in SoundCloud rap, when you see a large white audience, more like a punk rock audience. And also it's, you know, you have more white rappers in, in uh, hip hop through these movements online. Anyone else? Can I just say really quickly why like white people monetizing it? Like obviously, I don't know, like it just, this might be like a little bit of a tangent, but it kind of like pisses me off. Cause I remember like, for example, like a rapper like Post Malone, right? Mm -hmm. He became really huge off SoundCloud um, with the song White Iverson, right? And then now he's like one of the biggest artists in the world. But then I think it was Rolling Stones who asked him about it. it was like, they asked like a really simple question. Like, do you listen, do you yourself listen to hip hop to feel something? And he said that he doesn't. And that he that never feels hip hop to feel something because he thinks that people shouldn't listen to hip hop to feel something, and it just okay. pisses me off that somebody who's made this much money and um like just made their whole name off the genre can disrespect it like that so openly. But that goes back to the use of the internet and the fact that an artist doesn't have to pay attention to what your what you feel about the culture because they can reach out immediately to an audience and just get those listens and get those uh, views. They can, also over, they can also overlook the history of hip hop. Going back to Little Yachty, uh, maybe about six years ago, there was a battle between, well, a little rift between him and old school, you know, a lot of old school rappers like Lord Jamar from Brand Nubian, because Little Yachty said he didn't, he didn't need to know about Tupac or he was better than Tupac, something to that effect. And the fact that, he could say that and still get major sales or major views without uh, having to consult with the originators or the pioneers of the music shows the rift that the internet created within hip hop because you no longer have to be beholden to um, who created the music or who was the best or who was the baddest because now I have an audience, I can create my own digital world and just speak to them and have, and grow my audience from there. Um, I've, another question I wanna ask you, since you're talking, since we're talking about how large the hip hop audience is and how fractured it is, do you still feel that hip hop is the voice of the streets? Is it the voice of, the Amer of American youth? Is it still the voice of black and brown people? I have, a, I have an answer. Go ahead. I don't, I wouldn't set any boundary for hip hop. If you, you might look at contemporary hip hop artists today, like uh, Kendrick Lamar or, 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 or Jay-Z, or if you want to go back to Curtis Blow and the Fat Boys and the earlier ones, I don't see any boundary because everybody seemed to have socially oriented music. Okay. And everybody, and, and everybody seemed to have music that relates to relationships. Uh, what, what's so your name? That's Tari. <laughs> what's your name? Tari. Tari. Yeah, this but is... I really wouldn't set up. I don't think that, that there's any limitation. It, the, 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 they, they come across in a sociopolitical way. And, 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 and they deal with relationships and love and everything. It's the voice of the people. Long story short. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's a bunch of hands up. I'd like to make sure we uh, hear from everyone. Uh, Noah, go ahead. No, I just want to say like hip hop right now is definitely not the voice of people in the streets. Like definitely like maybe even at like 2008, like that's probably when it stopped. Like as soon as Lil Wayne dropped part of Ford, that's mm -hmm. when, that's when the streets, that's when speaking on the streets was dead, to be honest, to me, like that's kind of, that's kind of bad. Except for Kendrick. Kendrick's different, but that's what, that's what, that's what I think makes Kendrick so like, that's what makes every song he has a banger. Cause like the amount of people that can relate to what he's saying is immense. Okay. Great. Right. I, got, um, I just want to get to these hands cause everybody wants to jump on this question. This is an important one. Rach, go ahead. I um, mean, I was going to agree with Terry, what Terry was saying. Um, I just feel like the term hip hop is just so, it's just too broad to just say it's the voice of um, this person or this person or this group of people versus this group of people. I just feel like it has evolved into something very, very, like just very different, very, very different versions of it. 
like when I think of hip hop, I think of a lot of different artists, but then I also don't listen to much as I don't listen to as much hip hop as I used to. So I'm not, I guess, very in tune with the current hip hop. But I don't know. I don't think there's a specific um I meant I guess like yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we get to the other hands, I was going to uh, say to your point, there is a difference between, say, in the 1980s, when there was a Black conscious um, movement within hip hop, which kind of coincided with the anti-apartheid movement, the anti-crack movement, or basically the rise of crack and the decimation of the streets, um, the racial violence in New York. New York, the hip hop at the time was, it was a small group of people um, and a small group of voices that could not only speak to those issues, but they had enough power and they were so concentrated that they could also move, <laughs> they could also influence the audience. So you could have something, and I'll give you an example. In 1987, anybody, has anybody heard of the group X-Clan? Nobody's heard that? X Clan is a rap group uh, from back in the 80s, early 90s, who were kind of a uh, cultural nationalist organization. They were like black, they were like black power, but they were more into African gear and you know, getting back to your roots as African, Africans. Um, one of their members organized a group of, of, of rap artists at a, a club called uh, the Latin Quarters. And at this meeting, he talked to them about all the gold they were. He was like, do you know that that gold comes from South Africa? And if, for those who don't know, back in the 80s, early 90s, South Africa was still under an apartheid regime. And one of their main product, one of their main uh, exports was gold that they mined. So he told the rappers, do you know that, you know, the gold that you're wearing comes from South Africa? And that we got to support the people over there fighting for their freedom. He said, so what we're gonna do, and he had all the important rappers of the day, and he said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop wearing gold, we're gonna start wearing African medallions. And from that time, from that moment on, when you saw videos, you stopped seeing gold, like Rakim used to wear dookie ropes, you started seeing African medallions. And that in turn began to have an effect on the hip hop audience. While the news had an effect and people began to became conscious, hip hop also began to um, have an effect on people's awareness of themselves as black people, of where they were in America. And, hip, and, in, and even in the West Coast, when they had to get you know, the, the gang uh, situation, they were able to organize into a, um, a cadre of rappers to, to, to do a song called uh, All From The Same Gang and kind of combat that. So you had a smaller group and you were able to impact your audience. What you're trying to say now with the internet, the, 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 the amount of rappers in hip hop has exploded and the audience has exploded and it's fractured. So it can't be that voice. It can't be that voice that has an absolute effect on the audience. It can only now reflect what's happening. It can speak for what's going on, but you're not gonna, like back in the eighties, you not only do you have one or two rappers speaking conscious, you had, a, it was pretty much a whole trend from East Coast to West Coast. Everybody was talking about, you know, black empowerment, know yourself or West Coast. They were like, we're going to kick the street knowledge. Now you have, now hip hop is so fragmented and so, the audience is so fragmented. The, the, the movements are so different. They, they all speak, uh, uh, they all speak on different topics, so you can't have this cohesive thing that kind of moves an audience, which is a great, which is a good thing, because it shows the music has moved on. But you can't have that same thing that um, hip hop once was, because now it is too big. Anybody else? Let's see those hands. Yeah, let's saying? get to Sal. Go ahead, Sal, please. Yeah. Uh, so I do believe that still to this day, uh, hip hop reflects the streets and whatnot. I just think that it, the conscious rap or anything that speaks on social issues isn't being brought to the forefront isn't being played on um like radio stations or anywhere that is big because it doesn't sell like party records too like it's all about capitalism and about how much money it can make mm -hmm. so i think if you really go out and listen there's so many other people and even for like i guess soundcloud music or like um music where it glorifies uh like the usage of drugs like especially prescription pills like even mm -hmm. though like it's being glorified 
feel like under like it still reflects something because there is an opioid uh, crisis occurring it's just like the users aren't like really going to a point saying yeah i have an issue they're just glorifying it but it does show what's going on you just have to look at it through a certain uh, lens i guess okay all right louis uh, I think he said everything to be honest, but uh, the previous uh speaker, but I think hip hop, what it has a, a it definitely has a larger demographic, it will always be inherit inherently black, it, it will always be that, it will always be about rhythm. It was all it will always be, if I had to put it in a historical sense, I guess it would always be about the proletariat, you know? it will always be about the working class, and so I don't think it'll ever move on from that, even if the demographic becomes. Uh, larger. I think it will always be inherently black. Now, when you say it would, I would want to ask you a question. When you say it's going to be inherent, it will, it's always will be inherently black. Like, what about it would make it inherently black? Since you have so many white rappers who come out and they've got skills. Uh, it's, it's always been about the culture. Even when you have a white rapper that has quote unquote quote, skills, um, there's a term in hip hop or in, uh, in black and Hispanic culture in general that's called. Uh, giving somebody the, the 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 invitation to the barbecue right oh, um that the pass yeah the pass right and I, I think that works um really well when it comes to the white rappers simply because or the cookout yeah like a family said i think it works because it's an invitation to the culture it's us letting them know hey what, what you're doing is cool like we we it's it's we encourage that it's you're, you're a part of our, our culture and that's why it will always be inherently black it i i think uh, American popular culture started with T.D. Rice and his minstrel shows. Uh, it's, it, it started with black, with black culture, even though I don't want to call that black culture. But uh, my point is that it, it's only- Oh, right no, what he, he ripped off was black culture. He's ripping off yeah, so what and, and even Elvis, and, and uh, you got a whole bunch of, I mean, the list goes on and on, but uh, so that I'm not speaking too long, that, that's how I feel. Oh, I think it will always be inherently black I, I think it'll always but I think also when you say it's inherently black I always make this argument um I always kind of joke with people I say you know white guys they can rap but they can't innovate it and it's not anybody's fault it's because rap or hip-hop well basically rap comes from literally the vernacular of young black and brown people when you speak in it and and if you want to find out what's new listen to what some you know some 12 year old is saying in his room and that new thing is going to be the new rap. Right. And so that's going to, that's going to lead it. And it does, it comes from, like you said, it comes from the culture, but it literally comes from the voice and then the, and the, the, the linguistic innovations of black people. I, I think it's also about ebonics and it's also about struggles, right? But that, and I, and that's I, what I'm we're saying yeah, the same thing. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh can't listen to, I don't want to sound a certain way, but to, to say the white man has struggles uh, and put that, translate that into hip hop. I don't think, I think it's less believable. Um, and so- uh, Eminem would, uh, Eminem would, uh, uh, argue out, would, yes. would argue against yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 there is a room, there's a, in hip hop, there is room for everybody's voice and their struggles. Sure. And again, going back to Eminem, when he came out and he talked, it was very important because um, a lot of American popular music doesn't discuss what goes on, maybe with country, with poor whites in America. And to have someone who's white come and come into hip hop with skills and able to talk about living in a trailer, growing up poor, that, show, that shows the world another side of America that America doesn't allow to be seen in mass. So, true, hey, true. Rach, your, your hand was up, and I want to make sure that you get heard so i want to get other people yes i want to oh, no I, I was just gonna i really was agreeing with what louis was saying so i was just gonna repeat what he was saying so anyone else well there's a question before you move on go ahead no no, no, no ahead. We, we hear about east coast hip-hop and west coast hip-hop uh we we have i have an idea of how it emerged over here in the West, in the South Bronx, over here in the East, in the South Bronx or North, wherever, but over out there in California, the West Coast. We hear about East Coast, West Coast rap and East Coast rap. Uh, who gave it to who? Or did they develop it out there in California on their own uh, spontaneously or who oh. gave it to who? 
Oh, the East Coast. Oh, well, basically the West Coast was like a lot of places around the country when it came to hip hop. You use New York as the template as how to rap the music you use. But eventually um, with artists like Ice-T, N.W.A. Um, I forgot the, the, the rapper who came over the store. Um, he had a rap called Battle Ramp. Todd, Todd B, Todd D, it was, it was his name, Todd was in his name. But anyway, they, and even Ice Cube, who sounded like LL Cool J when he first came out, they began to feel like, you know, we need to tell our stories, which is really what hip hop's about. It's about standing where you are and telling your story and affirming who you are. With the West Coast, they began to, figure out what's big in their lives. So they started to talk about the streets like Ice-T, Six in the Morning, or NWA, Gangsta Gangsta. Um, and they also began to use music that they grew up on. I mean, we grew up on funk and zap and P-funk and that, you know, that heavy on the one, but they really grew up on it because it's kind of like, it's funky, but it's also menacing. And so they developed their own sound. I don't know if I'm answering it uh, yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the West Coast DJs like, I mean, even producers like Dr. Dre, um, DJ Pooh, they would, you know, they dug into music that they grew up on, you know, like the Silvers, again, Zach, uh, P-Funk, and they just kind of, that became their sound because that's what connected to their audience. And it really kind of uh, created a great backdrop for what they were talking about in terms of the streets, um, the troubles that they go through with the police, um, crime, you know, and, you know, we grew up, a lot of us live on the East Coast. We don't know what kind of uh, insanity <laughs> they live with on, on the West Coast. And they were just trying to explain it. I've, li I've lived on the West Coast for about 10 years in LA. I didn't spend a lot of time in Compton or, 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 the, or Watts. I didn't go there. But from what I have experienced, they live a whole other life. They have a whole other mindset, a whole other, li whole other lifestyle that you would have on the East Coast in New York, in New Jersey, uh, Connecticut. And that's how they pretty much developed this out. I mean, with the, with, the, with the East Coast, it's obvious. We, funk, you know, we got funky and soul, we want skills. Um, hip hop was created here in New York. So it was about expressing yourself. So that's why New York rap sounds the way, it, well, the way it did when it was emphasized lyrics and styles and, you know, trying to dazzle the audience as well as connect with the audience. So that, does well that said. answer? Well said. All right. Uh, any other hands? I saw some other hands or no? All right. Um, let's see. Also, um, well, I mean, just, and someone said that a hip hop is not, it might not be reflective of uh, what's going on with Black Lives Matter. I think also, black, I think the internet, while it has helped hip hop spread um, to all corners of the world, I think with the internet and how it's affected American life, uh, especially how we deal with um, the racial strife, the gender strife, the, you know, the strife, you know, the gender battles, the um, sexual orientation, LGBTQ. Um, and let me go specifically to like Black Lives Matter. I think the internet also, again, diminished its power because now mm. hip hop, you don't have to go to hip hop to figure out what's going on in the streets. Where can you go now? You can just go to YouTube. Hmm. Like white America knows more about black oppression now through videos than they do through an NWA record. Hmm. So now it's a matter, so with the internet and the fact that it's, um, it's showing, it, it, it's opening these doors to all of these various lives and all of this, injustice in the, in the country, you don't really need a, a musician to kind of tell you, people can kind of see it and people can react accordingly as we've seen in the streets with the protests, um, the, you know, whatever has been happening over the last year. Um, and so now you have a matter of 
pop culture now following <laughs> what's going on in the streets, not the streets following what's going on in hip hop. So. Oh, anyone has any, anything? Professor to say? Uh, Granville says it's uh, it's sort of voyeuristic, and I and I wonder if, if Professor Granville would want to you know jump in and use her own voice instead of. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> I've got really terrible internet today, and you know um, I teach social hip hop all the time, so I, I didn't want to kind of jump in in this conversation. But um, you know, I think the point on the internet is really interesting because, especially as we think about like Black Lives Matter right now and thinking about sort of police brutality and the way that we are all bombarded with images and don't have as much control about the filter, right? So that's one thing, that the internet is, is just this open access field and you have to curate what you experience. That's the same thing about social media. It's the same thing about your music, right? Like you right. can have Spotify and never hear uh, conscious rappers, right? Um, you can have Apple Music and never hear a female rapper that isn't Nicki Minaj or Megan Thee Stallion or Big Lotto at yeah. this current moment. And so I think that, um, to your point a little bit earlier, I think that, you know, in terms of, in terms of what the internet has done, it's hyper sort of commodified hip hop meaning that I can pick, choose, and refuse the elements I want to engage in, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe all of you guys can think about this image, but a couple of years ago, maybe it was a year or two ago, I can't even remember the name of the rapper right now, Sheck West, the Sheck West song, right? And there was an image that was circulating of just a bunch of white folks and the way they were going off to that song, right? And I remember watching it and feeling like, man. Oh, you hold it. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm ignorant. You have to catch me up on what Oh, happened. Sheck West. Yes. Right. So Chef West is, um, I think he's East Coast, right? Um, I'm also, you know, I'm not in the generation of sort of these younger uh, artists at this moment, but because I teach social hip hop, students are constantly sort of telling me uh, newer rappers, right? He's not even that new at this point because the shelf life of a rapper in hip hop is so fast at this point. Okay. But this was a song that was incredibly popular, right? I can't remember, but there's a particular refrain and everybody would do it. And there was a video circulating where it's just a bunch of white folks dressed really nice at like a preppy party and they were going off to this song. And there's a trend of literature in hip hop that looks at white consumption of the music particularly and what they like about the music and how that can in turn shape what comes out there, right? So I think voyeuristic in the sense that it's one thing to sort of watch The Wire or to listen to a rap song that's very violent and you know sort of fetishize what's happening and know that it's still different from where you're going to lay your head at night in your experience it's another thing when it's really an expression of authenticity right and i feel like that's what like hip-hop's popularity is about now it's commodified so authenticity has like been diluted there's five six levels before you get to just i want to make the music i want to make and i think even with black lives matter like i think about little baby Little Baby's a newer rapper. He just put out a song, The Bigger Picture, and it was Bigger very picture, yeah. focused on that, right? You've got Kendrick and J. Cole, who've both done performances tied to sort of issues with, you know, um, black, uh, black oppression and anti-Black. And at the same time, hip hop's shelf life is so much so that I think, yeah, they're gonna be goats, but there's a new generation who will never listen to them. And if it's not five minutes for a TikTok and it's not Soldier Boy Draco very quick, right, which is what music is moving to now. Hip hop songs are created for quick streaming. And if you can get those 30 first 30 seconds for it to sound good, you're kind of in the clear, right? There's so many songs that I find to be quite silly content wise, but they're gonna be popular. And it allows for, I think, white audiences to consume in a safe way without having to engage with the deeper culture, right? Last comment I'll make, cause I actually do have to run. You know, American culture, we love to eat the other, right? So we'll go to Chipotle, we'll go X, Y, and Z, right? And what we're really experiencing is, right, culture that's been stripped of the people who've made it. Um, and I think that's the sort of, you know, perilous place that hip hop is right now is that the people making it, there's five to six levels in between them and the art. It's not art for art's sake in the beginning, like it was when there wasn't any money in it. Now it's, I can make money. And to be honest, I need to have made money before I actually make the money. Right? right you have to look like you made the money before you exactly method yeah. man said that recently where he was like he wants to know what these rappers are getting you know for for checks because they're all with these blinged out jewelry and they're new right, right. so i think that and I also you know my last comment really 
is that, you know, hip hop artists now, it's not just the music they sell, they sell themselves as the brand. Mm -hmm. How can you sell yourself as the music? So the baby, right? A rapper that I used to love, but he's also a brand, right? And his brand is, I'm going to punch you out. I'm going to be aggressive. Like that's his music. That's his brand. And people are actually still, right? You know, I like that. Femi says performative blackness. Yes. Right. And, and just to be clear, you can perform a version of blackness that is palatable and be black. Right, and I think that's what we see often. Um, I have to go, so that's why I made my comment long. But you all are really wonderful. This class is really wonderful. Professor Napoli, thanks for inviting me. If y'all want to go deeper, come and join me in Social of Hip Hop as well, or you can come and take uh, Consumer Society with me, which is going to be real deep too. But y'all are a really great group. Professor Reeves, this is really wonderful. I'm looking forward to diving into your book. Um, I have to go, but thanks. Right. Thank you. And it's funny because she just destroyed my whole idea of what I was looking at with hip hop and the internet because I felt like around in the two, I say around 2015, probably like the early uh, 20 teens, that hip hop kind of recreated itself, kind of re, yeah, it kind of recreated its whole landscape into this new thing where it was like new rules. And because I'm a little older and I come from the era where, you know, again, skills over money, that days were these new rules. And I had to kind of uh, listen to the artists and, and not say too much, but apparently there's still issues, uh, issues with, go, with, with the music and how it presents itself to its mainstream white audience. And the fact that it's getting fractured and, you know, not being able to, uh, I don't know, just be what it used to be. That's what I'll say. That's what I'll say, so. All right. So with that, um, let's see. I'm gonna open it up to any, um, any other further discussions, any questions or? Well, can you address, oh, Tamir, please go ahead. I don't wanna uh, preempt, go ahead. Oh, no. No, if you had a question, like, uh, mine wasn't more so about, like, I don't know, like, my, my question is, like, for you, because I, I actually view, like, a, as a hip-hop historian, like, the way you, like, describe yourself and, like, your work. So my question is, like, mm -hmm. as of now, what would you consider, like, obviously, we all know the, the capital of hip-hop, like, in a historical sense, is the Boogie Down Bronx, right? But as mm -hmm. of right now, what do you see is, as, the, as the capital of hip-hop, like, as we know it today? What I just said, I think the, the internet is kind of the capital of hip hop because it uh, it allows people from various regions. The before before the internet, it was where you were from and where you were at. Um, so you kind of started your own movement. You built up that movement. You uh, went mainstream and you took that movement to the rest of America. Now you can just connect to the world instead of just connecting to you know, your particular group. You can just form your own group with social media. I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering your question, but it's like hip hop is without borders now. There are no borders in hip hop. And there's no kind of, there is no kind of capital or where things are, who's, who's kind of um, revolutionizing the music. It's, you know, SoundCloud, they revolutionize the music. It's lo-fi and as simple as it is, um, you know, they begin, that music is kind of a, uh, one of the centers of American pop music. Like you have people like a Taylor Swift or, you know, uh, what's the, was it of Billie Eilish? You know, they, they must go through that music to, to, to be able to capture the streets or take something from it in some way and to incorporate in their music, whether it be the 808s or, you know, the sing-songy rhymes or, to kind of, you know, connect with an audience. So. Bren, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I was hoping to hear more about your definition of Americana music versus American music, which I know you spoke about in the beginning and I'm sorry if I'm asking you to reiterate something that you already spoke about. Mm -hmm. Oh, when I was talking about hip hop Americana, I wasn't talking about Americana music. I was saying- Right, hip hop specifically. The yeah. music and, and the culture is kind of now settled into the center of American popular culture. So it's like, along with, you know, a, with jazz, with corporate America, it's just, it's a part of our everyday lives that people aren't shocked by anymore. You understand? 
it's, yes, just, it's, some, it's something that it connects with the pretty much the broader um, world of America. Like I said, with again, I use the example of Ruth, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's like when you showed her picture with the crown, it was, it's like, you know, no one, no one bats an eye. Everybody gets the, it's, gets the reference. It also gives her cred with, you know, the hip crowd, with the younger crowd. So would you say that in comparison to other musical genres, there's something about hip hop that's like, would you, I guess, say that it's like on the same plane, on the same level as other musical genres now that it's been so like subsumed into American culture or like, let's say you take something like country and you'd say like, there's just a fundamental difference between country and hip hop in its origin. Or would you say that it sort of gets stripped away because it's so ingrained now? Um, as far as origin, they're pretty much the same. The music that, the music that affirms um, you know, outside populations in America, whether it be rural country or black and brown urban. Um, how it's different, again, country music, rock music, a lot of times it, it has to, it deals with performance, it deals with production, it deals with um, orchestration. Hip hop, again, I said it was, it's the best, it was the, it, it, it had the best fit for the internet because it comes, the, the music itself comes from a technological base. It's produced on turntables. Well, before it was produced on turntables with records spliced together and you tape it and you put it out, tape recorder. Um, you don't really need instruments. You can rhyme, you can put it on and it basically can be distributed very easily. And, and it's also a very youth oriented music and who's on the internet? Young yeah. people, young people. Um, country music, I'm sure it connects, it connects with young people. Rock, of course, connects with young people. But these aren't, these are kind of like older genres that connect with a certain group, certain uh, time, and they're not as popular. Hip hop is now something that, you know, people can, I don't know, it's just, it just kind of fits. Oh, and also hip hop like a lot of genres, it can change, it can shift. It can go, it could be in India and you could incorporate Indian music with a beat and it'll connect with that audience. It'll go to this part of the country and connect with that group if you change the beat around. And it it's very versatile because again, it's very technologically based. Yeah, thank you, that's really interesting. I have one more question yeah. and if there's no time, I understand, but I'll just put it out there. Do you think that, um, when white people first started making their own hip hop music and like borrowing from black culture and then like putting, I don't know really if there's any white culture in hip hop when it first came out or like, I guess in the nineties, I don't know if there's anything that's like white that was put into hip hop. Um, not that there really is like white culture per se, but do you think that that was appropriation? Um, no, I, when, when you say when white people use hip hop? When or, they make hip hop, like when they don't include black artists in their production of hip hop, like when it was first coming out as a genre. Oh, when it was first come, well, when it first came out as a genre, the first people to kind of put it, the first people to put it out was a black owned label, Sugar right. Hill Records. Um, as white record owners began to, to, to uh, gravitate toward it, I don't think it was appropriation. I think there was a, a love of the, the idea of the music. And I think that there was also a, well, as business people, of course, there was a potential for a new market. Um, as far as, how it's made or what's incorporated in it as white, you know, sort of like various forms of white culture. Um, all black culture, it basically has some form of white culture within it. I mean, you have jazz, which if you want to look at his bass, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a band music. So it's like brass bands, which is very, you know, European American, but at the same time, it's used rhythms on top of each other's with each instrument, which is kind of an African concept, was it Af was African kind of siphoned through an American uh, filter. The same with hip hop. It's like, you know, the beat, those beats and those rhymes, I mean, they come from our experience in America interacting with white people. So it's cool. What I'm saying is it's gonna automatically be there and you're gonna automatically have people in there. It's just a matter of the, 
of you're gonna have white people dealing with it. It's just a matter of getting to getting over the history of uh, the racial history of America and dealing with it. I don't know if that was confusing, but I'm just saying it's a lot to it's a lot to deal with when you're dealing with, you know other cultures coming into black music. So One of the reasons I think the question comes up, Marcus, is that um, I made a very um, a deliberate and conscious point to uh, look at a number of uh, R&B records from the 1950s that were covered by white artists at a moment when um, these, uh, these African-American artists were not owned by white labels like RCA and, and others. And it was plain that what they were doing with the music was capturing the sound to some degree, but what, but modifying it in a deliberate effort to make it appeal to white audiences who were listening to black radio stations for the original. So they were gonna mm -hmm. smother those, those original records by re-recording them by a Pat Boone, just as one example I used in class, um, and essentially kill the sound, but mm -hmm. by, by capturing it. And I, I called this uh, one of the most egregious cases of, of cultural appropriation that I know of, and there are many naturally, um, but I, I suspect that's where Bren's uh, question comes from. If I'm putting words in her mouth, and she's certainly welcome to to tell me I'm wrong. And hold it, I was going to say, and Bren, if you really want to look at like the best example of what you're talking about is SoundCloud rap, because that kind of rap, it was it's created by a small cadre of rappers who totally use the internet to um, get to their basically it's like a rebellion against the virtuosity of hip hop. So it's like, it's kind of a punk version and it appeals to a mostly white audience. And a lot of the rappers are white. And so I guess in terms of innovating the sound, I guess it kind of is like the way uh, uh, rock and rollers took rhythm and blues and kind of injected their own sound into it and then kind of took it off in a whole other direction maybe SoundCloud rap will be that one where it just totally goes into a sort of a rock and roll situation, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. So. Xander, go, Xander, go ahead. You, I think your hand was coming up. Yeah, I, I, so I had a question. Um, I mean, cause we were discussing, you know, the, the origins um, as well. And, and I, my question is more so, um, how, how then, in regards to, you know, a, assessing whether or not something um, was inherently, uh, you know, negative from the, the, the broader white community in terms of how they're, you know, taking these things and processing them. And, and, and you, I think you had, had mentioned this, or I, I had thought that, you know, it's similar to how other minority cultures, myself being Jewish, you know, are, are in, integrated in these societies and are a part of them and take things from them. But simultaneously, um, you know, African-Americans in the black community here specifically are in a lot of ways have been forced into this community, which is not necessarily the same as many other minority communities that have, you know, um, uh, emigrated more by choice, honestly, just, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a, a very different nuance to that. And I, and I wonder how that, I guess, factors in um, because I don't feel like it's, you know, it, it's heavily discussed as in terms of whether or not, you know, there is an extra level of depth to the appropriation that occurs because of that factor, as opposed to, you know, even differences with other minority groups in the United States that do, you know, interact so uh, heavily. Uh, was, was, do you have a question too? Or no? Just... Well, no, I, 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 I mean, I guess that's my question is, is what's your perception of that? Like, to what degree is it, um, you know, notable uh, and, and has it historically been relevant? That what the whites? Well, that that um, sorry that that uh, you know, especially African Americans in music, uh, you know, and their interaction with the broader you know white and and other audiences has been shaped by the fact that they are taking things you know, like you said, the origins of uh, you know jazz and all that, but it's from a place of well, we were forced to be here, um, and we're you know as opposed to. Uh, you know, we came here, we want to be a part of the community. We were, I mean, uh, you know, the 12 million people were, were, were brought here, uh, not by choice. And, and I feel like, yeah, I, I want to know what factor that was. Um, I think that, I think when, when forming various aspects of music, I don't think people are so consciously thinking about where they, you know, where we are in society, like we are in a, in a white society. I think it's just a matter of 
trying to figure out something that, or try to figure out making something that makes you feel good and affirms who you are and affirms your culture and your, you, you know, your life. And it's just a matter of other people connecting to it. I don't really think that, you know, black people are, what we do isn't really shaped by, you know, the thinking about the larger white society. I think it's just kind of a meet a, an immediate kind of a gut response to, you know, what's needed at the particular time. On the one hand, and I want to say that, that I, bet, I bet musicians do think that way on the one hand. And on the other hand, your book makes it really clear that there were some people that you found attractive and I found attractive as artists that did think that way, um, especially in the early days. Oh, but no, when I say, I'm sorry, when I was saying that, I was saying that when you were initially thinking about coming up with something, you're not like thinking about that. But as time goes on and, 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 and genres build, people are very conscious about what they're doing. And going back to the 80s with rappers who realized that they had a platform of a larger audience and they could speak and, 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 and uh, affect change mentally or whatever, affect your consciousness, then you begin to get that. So uh, that was it. And it was yeah, part of you. what, part, part, part of what seems to, I think, if I remember the argument of the, the book correctly, <laughs> it begins to disappear um, by the mid nineties. Some of that, some of that conscious music begins to fade. Um, I remember joking with you that I kind of personally lost interest in hip hop with gin and juice. It was like the end for me. It's like, uh, I was like, you know, things have, things have changed and this is not the, the music that I was interested in 10 to 15 years prior. I think I had the same revelation you did when I walked into a friend's house and you, you mentioned gin and juice from that same album they were playing. I'm not gonna say, you know, for my N words and my B words, throw your hands in the air. And when I heard that, I just, I was shocked. I was like, this is what it's all become. And that's why, again, I began to kind of pull back from it. And to this day, I, I know what's going on in hip hop. I see what's happening. I know that there, you know, rappers talking about Xanax and all kinds, you know, all kinds of drugs, but I, I don't really get into it because it's just like, it's, well, it's not my voice anymore. It's not, you know, I'm a 50 year old man, so. Excuse me, Mr. Reeves? Yes. Sorry to shift a little, but before you run out of time, can you mm -hmm. give us the title of your book on the ISBN number? Oh, it's called Somebody Scream. Okay. Rap Music's Rise to Prominence in the Aftershock of Black Power. That's it. You could, you could uh, look that up. Okay. On okay. okay. It's at Barnes & Noble? Uh, I would go with Amazon. That's a better, okay. that's a better look. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm, no problem. Uh, any other questions or. Again, uh, before we end, before we end this out, I apologize for the flustering. It's just like a lot of information to cover and your brain can kind of get twisted and, and just <laughs> what this can get crossed. So. Mr. Reeves, we got to okay. learn about history every single day. I think I can speak for everyone when I say this is one of the better classes. So you did a great job. Thank you. All right. And yeah, so you ain't got to worry about, you know, being anxious or nervous. I, I think we all enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. I just want to say that I am a history major and I enjoy my history classes, but I did enjoy this conversation. <laughs> Um, discussion. I just want to put that out there. I'm going okay. again. I'm disagreeing with Louis, but I did enjoy this conversation. Um, this talk. It was very interesting. And I liked hearing what you had to say. I love this group, and you know why. Yes. <laughs> very engaging. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I'm going to create a question of writing prompt on the basis of this um, within the hour, and I'll, I'll post it and send it around. Mr. Reeves, our our our, our grateful thanks. No, no problem. Am I, do I leave now or are you guys? We're uh, done. The class oh. is over. Well, thank you. Oh, thanks <laughs> thank again you. for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, hopefully we okay. can do it again sometime. I yeah. will buy your book, okay? All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks all. And if you want to talk to me, anybody wants to talk to me, I'm here. Oh, Professor, and I actually have class in five minutes, but I know on behalf of my group members, I'm in group five, that we were looking for a little bit of... Um, I guess clarity, or maybe we're just not.